Hello and welcome to The Wire. My name is Shuddha Brata Sengupta and I'm doing this for the first time, but I have a wonderful guest and interlocutor today, um, Professor David Shulman, who's an emeritus professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So welcome again to Delhi and welcome to The Wire. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, you're no stranger to The Wire's readers because you've published with The Wire and I know that a lot of what you've written is um, excited a lot of comment. Is there anything that you remember that with readers' feedback or something like that? Uh, there was one incident. Um, you know, from time to time I publish these reports from the field um, because I'm active in the, this group called Ta'ayush in the Palestinian territories. Um, and uh, perhaps I should say first that whenever I go to South Hebron Hills or to the Jordan Valley with Ta'ayush, which is maybe two, three, or four times a month. Um, when I come back, I, as a kind of catharsis, I have to write up what I've seen. These are very kind of often uh, traumatic, in any case, very powerful experiences. And then from time to time, these reports make their way into the wire. You know? So um, I should perhaps say that what we do when we do go into Palestine is um, mostly uh, these are acts of solidarity with the civilian Palestinian population. Um, we protect them to the best of our abilities from what are very often violent attacks by Israeli settlers, sometimes by the soldiers or the police uh, or some other member of the um, security apparatus, or whatever. Um, without our presence there, that is the presence of Israeli activists, these shepherds and farmers would very likely have no access to their historic lands at all. They'd be chased off of these lands at gun, gunpoint. Um, so we go there to protect them, and, uh, and uh, we're also involved in litigation land cases, and again, trying to protect their rights. Um, one of the times when I published uh, one of these pieces in The Wire, um, somebody uh, Somebody from the States uh, uh, took offense, actually, and said that we were only prolonging the occupation by somehow sweetening it, as it were, uh, by providing some kind of break on the authorities. And that really, um, because the relations between the occupied and the occupiers are inherently asymmetrical, uh, we were somehow contributing to the status quo, you know, and to perpetuating that. Um, she was a very uh, strong supporter of the BDS movement. And I could understand her point, because this is a discussion that we've actually had among ourselves, you know, from time to time. We asked ourselves, are we doing the right thing? Might it not be better, you know, just to let the occupation take it, its grisly, miserable course, and perhaps that would quicken the end in some way? Um, but we've always, again and again, every time this comes up, we've come to the conclusion that we cannot do that. And that's what I wrote back in reply to this person. I mean, what, what are we to do? Are we simply to abandon our friends who are indeed very close to us by now and we to them? Are we to leave them to the, you know, to be preyed upon by these settlers, attacked, possibly killed, possibly imprisoned uh, indefinitely? Or are we to somehow try to, to stand by them and to be with them so that they don't feel so alone? When, when you think of it like that in a very concrete human way, then it's really not such a difficult question to resolve, you know. Well, that makes me think of something that ties in with the other reasons why you're here. I mean, many readers of The Wire may not know, but Professor Shulman is a professor of Indology, a scholar of Sanskrit, Telugu, Tamil. And I have, that's how I came across your work. Uh, I'm an artist and I end up reading all sorts of things, but I was very interested in some ways in which you were looking at um, material that, that I think is extremely relevant, but is also quite ancient. Um, and you gave a lecture just last week, uh, which I had the good fortune to moderate, on called Nigam Sharma and um, the question of the ordinary wickedness in, yes. in relation to uh, what the work that you're doing in um, Occupied Palestine. Right. And one of the things that struck me was exactly this point, of, that there is no position of, there's no Archimedean position of innocence from which one can proclaim that one's hands are not stained by, by moral doubt. Yeah. Um, so how does this relationship between the reading of texts in 
languages like Tamil, Telugu and Sanskrit and what you discover in them impact or what relationship does it have with the concrete human political work that you do? Um, I'll try to explain it in a minute as best I can. Uh, it's not so easy, but um, before that, let me just say that um, uh, with reference to the Archimedean point or the absence of such a point, my close friend, Professor Yaron Israhi, a very well-known political scientist in Israel, he likes to say that a clean conscience is a conscience that has not been used. So <laughs> on the basis of that principle, uh, I think I would say, uh, in my own words, I would say much of what human beings do, including or perhaps especially in very fraught situations like what we see on the West Bank, um, much of what they do um, comes out of a context of some kind of moral ambiguity. It's rather rare uh, to find great moral clarity. I mean, there are moments, of course, when one has that. But in general, I think what one tries to do is the best one can, given the fact that there's not going to be some sort of absolute litmus text, uh, test to tell you what is, what is good and what is bad. So within those um, conditions, it's, in, it's extremely important to act. I mean, the worst thing is to remain, to remain silent. Now, to try to draw, <laughs> draw in the various threads you've asked me about how, how I can actually put it like this. I spend my mornings, let's say, reading, um, I don't know, uh, classical Telugu poetry or, or modern Malayalam literature or something like that. In the afternoon, I find myself um, trying to protect with my body these Palestinians who are uh, shepherds or farmers and from the ta attacks that are directed against them. But um, although it can be, it can feel sometimes a bit confusing mm. and disorienting. It can certainly feel like that. Uh, in general, I, I feel that my life is not compartmentalized and that uh, these kinds of issues that interest me, uh, they are universal issues. They're articulated often in very powerful ways in the classical texts, you know. I mean, I often feel we face these ethical dilemmas all the time in the field. Um, if I read the Antigone, it feels as if this was a text written for me. Um, if I read the story of Nigama Sharma that you mentioned, this was a wicked fellow who found his way to a fuller humanity, then that too seems germane to the kinds of things that I'm seeing and witnessing. Um, I might say that in, in just a few months in February, I'm going to be in Sri Lanka uh, with friends of mine for a conference um, organized by Charlie Hallisey from Harvard and Jonathan Spencer, uh, who's a very well-known anthropologist of Sri Lanka. We're doing a conference on conscience, on the idea of conscience in South Asia, um, on the vocabulary that people bring to bear upon this question now or in the distant past. And um, this is going to be an unusual conference with, with uh, people from both the Singala and the Tamil communities, some of them activists, also artists and performers, and then some sort of dusty academics like me, you know. And uh, so uh, in that sense, you know, there's a tremendous continuity, con continuity, I think, between the kinds of things I, I'm reading and what I'm doing. But there, miss, there must be something that, I mean, I'm interested to probe you a little bit on this question. In reading classical texts, in reading, uh, in a in, in lifelong formation in the humanities, let's yeah. say, you started, I believe, as a scholar of Arabic, and you've studied Sanskrit, you've gone on to Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam. Yeah. You're constantly faced with the resolute image or the presence of the untranslatable, yes. of someone who is difficult to understand. That's true. Right? And I can sort of transpose, and it's not an equivalence, but let's say triangulating the worlds of the soldier of the Israeli Defense Forces, the settler in the West Bank, and the shepherd who is an inhabitant, and you as a witness to this triangulation, mm. seems to be a negotiation of many untranslatable 
possibilities. Yeah, that's quite true. Um, and we have to remember that every situation is always uh, not only specific, but unique. There are no situations that are not singular in life or in history. So, I mean, one could easily say uh, that it's more or less impossible to translate, you know, the settler's mind into the Palestinian shepherd's mind or into mine. You know, the odd thing is that in practice it's usually not so difficult. Uh, one of the odd experiences that we have, it's a recurrent experience, is that um, Israel, you know, being a very tiny place after all, it's a tiny little place, there's uh, often a kind of intimacy of um, enemies. I could give you some concrete examples, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, um, there was a settler. Uh, he was Swiss, actually, um, Swiss and had studied in Germany. He, came, he, he converted to Judaism and then following the kind of uh, inertia of that initial move, you know, he found his way into the settlement. So I first knew him as a uh, kind of harsh uh, antagonist. He was uh, fond of fencing off huge areas of Palestinian land, just unilaterally fencing it off, and then prohibiting, of course, the rightful owners from having any contact with that space. Uh, they would come in the morning and suddenly their land was gone. You know, fences around it, and uh, the settlers, including this man, um, they carry submachine guns, you know, so, I mean, this was, and occasionally uh, I would meet him there in the field and we would have um, very, you know, hot, heated discussions about what he was doing. And he had all kinds of rationalizations for this. He would say to us, well, you know, in Germany, he would say there's a law that the land belongs to whoever plows the land, whoever works the land, you know, so why not here? That's the law he's going by. Although, actually, even under Israeli law, which is rather lenient about these things, as you probably know, uh, what he had done was, of course, completely illegal, no question about it. It was also more or less irreversible, because every time a settler steals a plot of land, and that's what they do all the time, um, every time that happens, usually, uh, almost always the, that land is lost to the Palestinian owner, or at the very least it would re require a lot of work, sometimes years of persistent um, drudgery, uh, in order to reclaim this land through the Israeli civil courts and so on. We've been through that lots of times. So this guy was like that, you know, and we'd had these rather heated discussions. A very interesting thing happened, which he was living in this settlement. Um, the settlers wouldn't accept him because he wasn't Jewish enough for them, even though he'd undergone an Orthodox Jewish conversion. Under Jewish law, he was Jewish. But out of purely racist reasons, they wouldn't accept him, you know. That's the new racism of the Israeli settlers on the West Bank. Um, and so they eventually threw him out. It, was a, it took some time, the courts were involved in a lot, but they eventually succeeded in actually throwing him out of this settlement. So, believe it or not, the people who took him in and offered him refuge were these same Palestinian farmers and shepherds whose, steel, whose, whose fields he'd been stealing himself, you know? It's a really amazing thing. Um, things like that actually can happen in Israel, given the very close proximity of all the sides. And the fact that they do, on some level, share some kind of universe of thought and discourse, even though politically they're on, you know, completely the opposite uh, scale. I think that that may be a general human phenomenon, you know? I mean, going back to a classical text, I seem to remember that the Old Testament has a, I don't remember which book, uh, the Tanakh, the Torah has, and therefore the Old Testament, the Bible, and yeah. it's repeated in the Islamic context the phrase that you have to be generous to the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. Absolutely. So, I mean, despite the fact that these are, these seem to be these irreconcilable uh, hostilities, mm. these are also populations that, for whom the commandment to be, to be generous to the orphan, the widow, and the stranger makes perfect sense. I mean, the Bible is a very multivocal text. You yes. can find opinions of all sorts there, but I can tell you a story or two to, um, just to give you an example of what you've just said. You know, so once we were in the South Kivon Hills, we were driving along the road, 
And um, suddenly we caught sight of an elderly Palestinian shepherd who had been tied physically uh, to a big rock. And these settlers, young, young people, um, I don't know, 18, 20 years old, something like that, they were tormenting him. They were beating him and screaming at him, and the sheep were roaming around, you know, without their shepherd. It was a terrible moment. So, of course, we stopped and we came and released him from this thing and, and confronted these uh, settlers. So, one of them said to me, one of the settlers came to me, and he said, um, interestingly, he said to me, I know that you hate me. So, I said to him, actually, you're quite wrong about that. Um, you may be surprised to hear it, but in fact, in a certain sense, I actually love you. So this took him by surprise. He was shocked, actually. And so he thought about it for a moment, obviously in a kind of moral quandary, what he was supposed to do. So finally he said to me, you're a Jewish, and the Torah tells me that I am supposed to love you like myself. And so I will try to do that. But if the Torah had not said it, I would definitely hate you. That's what he said to me. <laughs> I can give you another example. Uh, we were once at a place called Susia, uh, that is Palestinian Susia. There's also an Israeli settlement, Susia, which is um, there to torment the Palestinian Susians. Uh, these Israeli settlers from Susia have a habit of sometimes invading the Palestinian encampment. It's an encampment of I don't know, um, tents and rickety shacks and things like that, sheep pens. They will come in and sometimes they'll shoot their guns and sometimes they'll beat people up and sometimes they'll just wreak havoc to the best of their ability. So there was a young guy and um, he was tormenting uh, an elderly Palestinian woman. He was, he was speaking to her just the most horrible kind of way treating her like an animal. He was like coaxing her with a little piece of rock as if she were a dog or something like that. So I interfered with this and he said to me, what are you doing here? And because they hate us, settlers hate us even more than they hate Palestinians. We're the ones who have betrayed mm. the tribe, right? You know, he said, what are you doing here? And so, you know, moments like that, you never know quite what to say. And usually you say something without thinking about it. So indeed, without thinking, I said to him, I'm here to fulfill God's commandments. It sounds a little better in Hebrew. Mm, Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. Tell us what it sounds like in Hebrew. So, you know, this, uh, for a second, he was transformed. He was completely shocked. I'd used his language. And he w but I'd used it, obviously, in a sense that was foreign to him, because to him, God's commandments allowed him to torment innocent Palestinians and take their land and mm. so on. But the very use of the language, which was a familiar language to him with a whole kind of, I mean, the resonance of 2,000 years of, uh, of, of Hebrew and the text, it stopped him and he, he went away mm -hmm. silently. I don't think it, you know, not for a second would I think that this changed him in any significant way. But for that one short second, I had the feeling that perhaps some slightly deeper part of himself had kind of peeked out of its hiding place. You know, I may have just fantasized that, I don't know. Let me turn to another part of this triangulation between the settler, the soldier, and the shepherd. Mm. The soldier. Mm. Uh, and I know, uh, and I know in conversation with you, as well as, else, uh, as, as well as in other contexts, that there is a growing movement within especially younger conscripts into the, because it's a conscription-based yes. defense force. Absolutely. When people enter their military service, that there is a, and also professional soldiers, there is an, a small but burgeoning element of soldiers who are choosing to, to use that stained cloth of conscience. Yeah. And that they are, in a sense, beginning to be the most important witnesses, some of them. That's true. Of the atrocities committed by their armed force. Yeah. And I ask this and I want to append to this question the fact that you yourself have been a soldier. Oh yeah. You you were a medic in the in one of the wars with Lebanon I and was. you told me about the rush and the excitement yeah. of the of the military situation. What is that difficult place that a young man or woman who is an Israeli soldier faces when they are faced when they come to face to face with their stained consciences? It's an enormous problem. 
you're quite right that there are numbers of soldiers, I don't know how many, um, who have you know, refused to, to do what they were asked to do, or who, after they were released from the army, came forward to bear witness about the kinds of things that they had seen or done, actually. So there's a group called um, Breaking the Silence, which, uh, in my opinion, these are the people who are somehow, somehow safeguarding the conscience of the entire Jewish people. But they're hated in Israel and uh, targeted and persecuted by the government. Um, they're all of I mean, them, all of the activists are in danger of um, government persecution, arrest, who, who knows what. The question of how it happens that a person who may not be particularly thoughtful or articulate or may never have read the Antigone or even heard of it, finds himself in a highly charged situation where he's asked to do things that are pretty clearly immoral, which is true of all soldiers in the occupied territories. How it happens that such a person is capable of stopping and saying, no, that's a mystery which no one can truly understand. Um, I have to say, 99% of the soldiers go along with it, with whatever they're asked to do. And you know, you're part of that system. It's almost impossible to extricate yourself from that system. For one, for one thing, there's no point at which you could say, I'm going to stop here. You know, you've been kind of going along for, let us say, I don't know, two months, six months, eight months, two years, sort of following the orders. There comes a moment where you can't do it anymore, but where is the, where is the place or the time, the, the particular instant when you say, no, I won't do this. I've been doing these kinds of things for two years. Suddenly, I won't do it. All I can say is that there are people, even if they're only 1% of the conscripts, who in fact reach that point and manage to say no, which gives me a certain faith in human beings and some hope for the future of Israel. Mm. I'm reminded of a poem by a Hebrew poet, Aharon Shabtai, yeah. where he spoke about um, his hope for the defeat of the, of the Israeli army. Oh, is that what he says? I don't know the poem. I know, I know Aram Shabtai, the friend. Yeah, I don't know that poem. Uh, he, I think the lines go, may, this, may, the, may we be defeated. Yeah. And I think that's an incredibly brave and courageous thing to say. Uh, I am saying, I am also mentioning this partially in your presence, because I think that some of the people who might be listening in and watching this, uh, this chat that we're having, might begin to think a little bit about what the Indian Armed Forces are compelled to do in the territories that they occupy uh, and on which there are similar, um, you know, a plethora of similar situations take place in Kashmir, for instance. So, you know, I, I have a kind of general feeling that although we seem to be living in a rather dark age, and there are certainly the similarities that you mentioned, um, the particular differences are in some ways more, more impressive than the similarities. Problems of conscience are going to be there no matter what. Any soldier who serves in any army is going to have problems of conscience, Absolutely. you know. But if I think about Israel and, and India, or one could name another 10 or 15 countries, you know, I'm, I think about them, the, the, first of all, in, the, there's the immense difference in scale, you know. In, in Israel, small-scale decisions have existential consequences for the entire, the entire state, and indeed the entire region. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a different story. And another major difference is that in India, it seems to me, just as a person who comes to India, but comes often, um, and who loves India, uh, it seems to me that the courts, especially the Supreme Court, are still functioning pretty well. We hope. Yeah, well, I've, you know, there's been, last, just last yes. week, there was something very positive, and uh, that was true in Israel until very recently. The Supreme Court, although it has a very mixed record, and a lot of the, many of the decisions relating to the occupation are, in my mind, to my mind, appalling. I think the overall record is not so good. Nonetheless, on human rights issues, the court has defended uh, what they call the basic law on human dignity. 
but this is now changing. Uh, the composition of the court has been altered by the Minister of Justice, who is trying to produce a kind of highly right. nationalist uh, court. And the recent decisions just two days ago, um, the court has allowed uh, the government and the army to expel a rather large Palestinian population from a place called El Khan al Ahma on the outskirts of Jerusalem. It's an unbelievably cruel, really barbaric decision, and yeah. the court has allowed it. Well, I mean, we have in, in our Supreme Court, there is a process underway in which 356 officers of the Indian Army have petitioned the court to allow them to kill with impunity. Now, the court has to is seized of this matter, and I hope that they take yeah. the right and human humane decision. Uh, I hope so too. <laughs> but um, I hope so too. <laughs> all bets are off. But um, before we end, as an Indologist, as a professor of Sanskrit, as a person who works with a difficult thing called conscience, like you said, you do your Tamil text in the morning, and you your body's on the front line in the afternoon. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what the word Tayush, the organization that you work with, means and how did it come into being? So it comes uh, from the Arabic root Asha, uh, which means to live. Um, and Ta'ayasha, the verb, means to live together. And Tayush is the action noun that is living together. Uh, in the very early days of Ta'ayush, uh, we used to be very particular about this and insist on saying living together rather than coexistence, which had to us a somewhat formal and removed um, sound ring to it, you know. It is about living together. And um, we're a mixed group of uh, Palestinians and Israelis working together in the name of what we think of as universal human values, you know, and facing whatever risks and dangers there are. And and some of you are arrested, some of you yeah, are harassed. Um, um, all of us have been arrested, and, and I think one time or another, maybe many times, and all of us have been beaten and sometimes shot at and stoned and all of that. That comes with the work. I, I should say it's not always like that. There are many times one goes down and, uh, you know, the uh, the grazing of the cattle goes by the sheep and the goats goes off peacefully, but um, uh, the danger of some kind of violent eruption is always there. It could happen within a few seconds, you know. Living together means you're prepared to take that risk. I, you know, I have a lot of friends in Israel, good people, wonderful people, who have all the right opinions and who detest the occupation and who see the moral decline of the state, but who are not prepared to leave their living rooms and their cafes. So over the years I've come to feel that having the right opinion doesn't really count for very much. And unless you're prepared to take at least some minimal risk, especially in situations of real um, moral urgency, then it doesn't really count to think the right thought, you know. What counts is to do the right thing. Thank you, Professor Schulman. I hope that this conversation makes us all think about what it means to do the right thing. Thanks. Thanks very much. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.